Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Friends of Europe's Critical Thinking Live. Today, we're launching a new series, which is about transatlantic dark climate dialogue. We bring you three budding you know, entrepreneurs who've developed tech solutions for individuals to take action. And so this is quite distinct in terms of our approach, where we've plucked people from the US, uh, the UK, and the EU to share and exchange their learning journeys, their experiences as entrepreneurs to create uh, tech solutions to tackle climate action. What we do know uh, in this fight against climate, climate change, whilst governments ponder and the private sector feel guilty and others talk about the fact that we haven't moved things forward, what we do know is that individual action matters. According to the UN, if only, let's say, a billion of us were to take individual action to reduce carbon, um, that would have a 20% reduction on carbon emissions. Quite a significant fact, obviously it depends on where these people are at, obviously, but it shows you what individual action can mean and can be if citizens, consumers have the right tools, have the trust, but also the kinds of behavior setting approaches that will help them and feel a sense that they're doing something to tackle climate change. So as I said, this is part of our new series uh, of uh, you know, transatlantic climate dialogue, where we're looking at tech solutions across both continents, if you like. And so what we want to do is be able to um, discuss with each of our entrepreneurs um, their particular app, their, their particular innovation. Because what we do know is that in the tech world, there is a raging debate about scale, opportunity, and um, efficacy of approach. Uh, whether we are just selling in you know, a snake or salesman, tell, sell, selling stuff to citizens, or is it real things that are happening? So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next half an hour or so. So thank you for tuning in. And I'm going to go straight to Sanjali. Sanjali, you, um, you are the um, uh, founder of Joro, and you have created an app that helps with consumer spending. Tell us a little bit about what it is you do and the impact Jorah has, but say a little bit about your view about whether, you know, how are apps a good way of uh, tackling climate action? Or affecting Thank climate? you. Thank you so much for having us uh, and for bringing us together for this conversation. As you said, Joro is an app that helps people take climate action through how they spend money. Uh, so what we do is allow you to connect your credit and debit cards, see the emissions behind every purchase you make and track, reduce and offset the emissions behind everything you buy. Um, the app is available in the US and Canada. And we started with spending because spending is something that we all do. It's part of our lives. And we wanted to help people who spend money understand how to take climate action through that simple act. Even though we have just a few opportunities to vote before 2030, uh, we have over 8,600 opportunities to spend money before 2030. And each of those opportunities is a way that we could reduce emissions. Um, I think the, the question about apps in particular, apps are this incredible tool we have on a device we carry around with us all the time. Um, it's a very intimate and accessible way to connect with climate change, which can be such a difficult and overwhelming problem. Um, and that was part of what we really liked about the idea of an app is that one, it's super scalable and we need these solutions to scale incredibly fast. As you said, a billion people, ideally before 2030, taking action together on apps like this. Um, but also it's a way that people can interact with it in a personal way. It's connected to you and your lifestyle and something you do every day. Um, it's not this amorphous sort of uh, overwhelming challenge that exists outside. Great, uh, Sanjali, thank you very much. And let's see what happens in terms of this exchange in terms of your ability to uh, cross, cross the pond and make it accessible elsewhere. Because I can imagine it will have traction for people uh, everywhere, in fact. But we'll come back to you uh, uh, in a moment or two. I want to turn to Marcus. Marcus, you're based in Germany. You're our EU kind of uh, uh, example, if you like. You kind of gave birth to uh, Klima. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what it does, because most recently at Earth Day, uh, a, a few weeks ago, you announced a, you know, an update of it, if you like, of your very successful application. What does it do that's different? But also, how does it kind of help citizens um, with this agenda of individual action? And, how, you know, part of what you do is you fund projects. How do you pick projects? So uh, a lot in that one question. Over to you, Marcus. 
Yes, thank you very much uh, for being here and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, Klima is, uh, is an app that helps every individual to take climate action. Um, the, app, the update that we recently released, I would say, uh, finally uh, fulfilled the initial uh, vision that we had to really create um, uh, a holistic tool for individuals to take climate action across three uh, three main areas that the, that the app represents. When we first started, we um, tried to condense the urgency and the complexity of the climate crisis into something that's actionable or becomes actionable for us as app developers. And that was the question, quite simply put, how can we get as much CO2 out of the atmosphere as possible? And we quickly realized that uh, we need to answer this, um, this question in three dimensions. First, immediately, we need to find solutions that we can apply today that have immediately measurable and, and trackable impact. The second one is we need to do something that works sustainably, that is part of the long form transformation that we all need, the decarbonization that we all need to go through as a society and as individuals. And the third part is to realize we need to go from individual action to collective impact. And so this um, yeah, trinity of immediately, sustainably and collectively is what uh, this new app updates now, fu now fully represents uh, across three functions, offset, reduce, multiply. The first one means after calculating your personal footprint within the app, you can then offset uh, with a monthly subscription the current emissions that you can't avoid uh, right away. Um, I sometimes compare that a little bit to how we treat garbage. We know we should create less garbage in our lives, but that doesn't mean we throw the ones that we have in the streets, right? And for carbon emissions, it should be the same way. We shouldn't just dispose it in the atmosphere for future generations to deal with. And luckily, there's solutions that help us deal with it right away. Next one, reduction, and this is something that I really want to emphasize, starts with education, starts with understanding, and yeah, getting climate literate, right? Understanding where do my emissions come from? What are, what are the physical uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, behind it? So that I can incorporate um, uh, yeah, carbon emissions into my daily decision-making and make it part of, of my habits. And then the third one, uh, and, and so in the app, uh, we now have uh, a video class that helps people kind of get climate literate. We have a personalized checklist that sh shows you exactly based on your data, what are the high impact versus low impact actions that you can do? How can you change your lifestyle? Um, and then we always, I always recommend get started where it's the easiest and then you're already on the journey and then can take one step after the other. And then the multiply aspect, the third part of the app, allows you to invite friends and become an advocate for climate action and then see in the app exactly measurably how much CO2 gets reduced, gets saved because of your advocacy, advocacy because we track um, exactly the carbon reduction from the friends that you bring on, as well as the friends of friends and the friends of friends as well. And so you see that whole snowballing effect um, that can be traced back to you. So this is kind of what Klima is and, and, and what we launched uh, on Earth Day. Uh, in terms of the uh, projects uh, that you asked about, um, there's a couple of uh, aspects that go into um, evaluating what projects are high quality. I know that uh, Joro does a great job also showing that on their website, the different aspects, additionality, for example, um, the longevity of the projects uh, or permanence, uh, rather it's called, uh, how much a positive impact does it have on the ground. So there's a set of different uh, aspects that go into the due diligence before onboarding projects for every, I would say, um, provider of carbon offsets that, that does good good work. For Klima specifically, we also do, um, um, comprise a portfolio along three impact areas, nature-based solutions, tech-based solutions, and social impact solutions. Okay. Because we believe that we need to address all these three uh, in order to uh, provide a holistic um, climate action uh, and one that is also just. Thank you very much for that. I'll come back to you because um, there's a couple of questions that occur to me and I'm sure to the audience that's watching and listening to this uh, in a moment. But let's, you know, we've, you know, we've looked at spending. We've looked at almost, I suppose, carbon literacy and you know, carbon reduction literacy and how do you create the ripple effect? Let's turn to waste. Uh, and so, Tessa, you've, you've kind of given birth to something, you're co-founder of um, Olio, which is an app about tackling waste in the home and local communities. Uh, tell me, tell us a little about your app, uh, how it works, just in, in the way that you know others have. But you know, importantly, who are its users, and what's, what is, what impact is it have, having on climate change? Is it the converted that's using your app, or are you be able to reach wider communities? Tough question, I know, Tessa, but over to you, and a warm welcome. 
Okay, thank you. Great to be here. So, yes, you're absolutely correct. Olio is an app that exists to tackle the enormous problem of both food waste, but also waste more generally in our homes. And we do that by connecting people with their neighbours so they can give away, run, throw away their spare food and other household items. And also now we connect people with their neighbours so that they can lend and borrow everyday household items instead of having to buy them brand new. So how it works is really simple. You just snap a photo of your item and add it to Olio. Neighbours living nearby get an alert, letting them know that something new has been added near them. They can then browse the listings, request what they want and pop around and pick it up. And I should stress that whilst Olio looks like it's an app, actually it's beating heart is that doorstep connection. The fact that we are using technology to connect people with their local community. And that's where the real magic takes place. And a lot of people, when they hear about Olio, um, might wonder if anyone would want their surplus food or other household items. And we remind people that there is no shortage of demand. So half of all the food added to the app is requested in less than 21 minutes. And half of all the household items that are added to the app are requested in less than three hours. So it works um, incredibly well to sort of redistribute the resources that we already have um, amongst us in our local communities. So uh, who is our community? We've had six million people join Olio. Together they have shared 50 million portions of food and 5 million uh, non-food items. That's had an environmental impact equivalent to taking 150 million car miles off the road and has also saved 7.3 billion litres of water. So phenomenal impact, but we're currently doing less than 0.1% of our full potential. So really scalable and really exciting. Our community um, is very representative of the population as a whole in terms of socioeconomic sort of profile, in terms of age, but the really significant skew is, is around gender. So two thirds of our community is female. Yeah. And to answer your final question, in terms of sort of, are we preaching to the converted or not? Um, for sure, I would say that to date, uh, our community has predominantly been those early adopters, but we're now going through this really exciting phase of sort of crossing the chasm, as we refer to it internally, and starting to appeal to and attract a much more mainstream community. And it does feel like um, for many years, it has felt like we're sort of pushing a boulder up a hill, and now it does feel like the, sort of the mainstream consumer is now very, very aware of the climate crisis and is desperately looking for something simple and easy to do to make a difference. Uh, and so we're really excited to see that more mainstream community coming to Olio. Tessa, whilst I've got you, let me ask a question, which I'm going to also ask the others that have, uh, are on here. What's, you know, you've just spoken about, you know, you're doing something quite dramatic, impactful, but it's 0.01% of what you could really do. Um, what's the one challenge or opportunity you see for um, actually moving this agenda forward in terms of promoting such solutions to uh, tackle climate change? Our number one, well, I guess we've got kind of two real challenges. The first one is around behaviour change um, and that, and getting people to believe that someone would want their surplus. So. It, for us, we're just constantly trying to encourage people to take the less than 10 seconds it takes to add their spare food or other household item to the app. And we're, yeah, sort of in terms of the product and the marketing, the communications, we're trying to harness the power of behavioral psychology and all those sort of nudges to really um, encourage people to do it. Because once they've had that experience, we hear unanimously it feels amazing to share. And once people have started using Olio, they keep using Olio. So the big challenge for us is that sort of conversion bit, encouraging them to give it a go um, for the first time. I think from a business perspective, the other really significant challenge has been around access to capital. We are a female co-founded tech for good, sort of early revenue business. And, and to date, uh, that has been challenging. We have prevailed, I'm very, pleased to say we have a, uh, a suite of phenomenal investors, but I really do think we could have gone further faster if we had had more access to capital. And I'm hopeful that this is changing rapidly as we are seeing more and more capital kind of flowing into the climate tech space. Indeed, Tessa, because I'm, I'm pleased that you said that because one of the issues for uh, women entrepreneurs in this tech field is that they are, they, the risk that investors put on them is so high that you don't get the capital flows that a man come up with something and just simply because of it's a uh, potentially all-male uh, outfit, 
he's likely to get more of an income. Uh, and, you know, I'm yeah. glad to hear that it's shifting. But go, sorry, going back to you. Well, yes. Yeah, so so I, this is something I feel very passionately about, actually, because since I have been working in this field of, of kind of, let's call it sustainability and impact more broadly, I have encountered the most diverse group of individuals I've ever seen, certainly uh, in comparison to my previous corporate career. So I see so many women and people from different backgrounds, and yet that is intersecting with the biases that exist and the lack of capital that is available for those groups of entrepreneurs. And so I feel very strongly that by shortchanging female founders and diverse founders, we are also shortchanging humanity because we are not getting the capital to the businesses that are solving these really existential problems. Well said, Tess. And perhaps one of the discussions we have in the future is that whole issue about you know, the you know, inherent gender uh, bias in accessing capital for tech women, tech entrepreneurs, and the, you know, the doubling effect it can have on wider issues. But thank you for making that point. Marcus, I'm going to come to you before I come back to you, Sanjali. The kind of the, issue, the same question I asked Tessa, what's that one big challenge or opportunity that you um, want to share with us? That could, you know, that stops us or could escalate tackling uh, climate action, so, you know, addressing climate action. Yeah, uh, one one thing that I think uh, is special about the uh, the climate tech space, and at least in my experience, and that, that I think can be a big opportunity, is that um, when you talk to other um, green tech founders, climate tech uh, founders at you know conferences or wherever it is, you realize that. Um, there is a new generation of founders in this space right now that are becoming startup founders for different reasons than maybe a couple of years back when it was, you know, whatever the VC trend was back then. Um, be because they, they, they come from it from a perspective of what do I leave behind? What do I, you know, uh, devote my lifetime to? What, re what, what does really matter in the end? What is the big problem that really humanity needs to be solved? And uh, I see that this leads to a, a field of peers that are much less competitive than other industries normally would see. And even if there's sometimes, you know, a sense of competition, it is definitely friendly competition. But more than anything, there's a feeling of this problem is so big. We're all in here for the same reasons. We need more, not less different approaches that try out what really works, cheering each other on. I think for me, sometimes uh, I see like there's a mindset shift in this realm that makes me hopeful because it's a different mindset as opposed to the mindset that got us into this mess to begin with and so i hope that this is something that also kind of uh, is a trend that kind of goes forward into kind of the larger part of economy and to you know future generations in general and the way we think about business and uh, and what really matters at the end of the day that's really nice to hear marcus that sense of uh, more of a a socially minded, a social conscious to business business uh, growth and development, which isn't just about the you know the bottom line, if you like, or the capital bottom line or profit bottom line. That's good to hear, and we'll come back to some of these points. But Sanjali, if I can ask you now, in terms of the same question, you know, what do you see as the uh, uh, problem or opportunity in, I suppose, uh, promoting this kind of approach to climate action? You know, you know, Jorah's done as you said, you described, but. You know, what, what, was, what are the main issues that are you facing in making this much bigger, for example? I'd say one of the biggest challenges we think about a lot is that people don't realize their link between money and climate. Uh, and if you do, it's, it's always a bad thing when we think about the fact that we spend money and it has an impact on the planet. What we want people to better understand is that that is a tool we have that we can use intentionally and we can use the, our spending choices to create a different kind of world because we as consumers together collectively have power because we shift systems and markets. Um, and I think that is something that's really powerful. People don't necessarily realize this thing they already know how to do every single day is affecting our global emissions because all of the things we buy all the services we use require uh, energy to power and a lot of that energy comes from fossil fuels. Um, so the way that we make those choices about our consumption actually do make a difference. And I think that's something that is both a challenge and an opportunity for us um, is that people don't necessarily think about this 
thing they do every day is, is something that could affect our, our shared climate trajectory. Um, and also it's, it's sort of this hidden superpower that we all have um, and that we can help reveal to people. Um, so that's something I think about a lot. And, and we hope to help people build carbon intuition, really an intuition for carbon the same way that we have for finances. We, we already know the costs of things that we buy on a daily basis. It's kind of like Imagine we had no idea what the price of things were, and we were just buying them all the time and racking up all of this debt, and we had no idea how we had all of this debt. And that's what Jorah was trying to do is say, manage your carbon like you manage your finances. Now you can just see the emissions behind every purchase. Sometimes you might choose a more expensive option, but overall you're managing towards a shared budget. And in this case, that budget is not just for you or your household. It's something that connects across all of us. Um, so that's that's what I think is is both challenging and and really promising. Thank you for that. Let's move to those communities that don't feel they have a hidden superpower. Uh, the poor communities yeah, in each of your areas, actually, you've got people, uh, uh, whether it's in Germany, the States, Canada and all over the world who are not digitally literate, who are having to make choices between fuel or food and don't have that sense that they're they're purchasing uh, um, uh, capacity has an impact on climate um, or that anything they do. Uh, will have a, an impact on climate because it's over there and, and their daily reality is about making ends meet day to day. So Tessa, can I come to you? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question, but you know, how do you get over that? How, what are you doing to be able to access those communities who feel that it's a luxury to tackle climate change? So our number one company value is inclusive. And from day one, we you know, our ambition is enormous. We want a billion people consuming by radio. So we've been very clear that we, we have to be inclusive. So whilst the sort of primary um, interface to Olio is our mobile apps, we did also very early on develop a desktop web app version of Olio. So that would provide people with access, even if they didn't have a smartphone, so long as they could get an internet connection, um, then they would be able to access the service. And today we see a really refreshingly sort of a representative group of people from the community using Olio. It's definitely not sort of just a middle class um, phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination. But the most important thing that we do is we feed back to people at every interaction, the impact that they're having, and we celebrate every single small step. So for example, you know, kind of a typical uh, food listing on the Olio app that ends up being shared, whether you're the person who gives it away or the person who picks it up, is equivalent to taking five car miles off the road. And giving people that data and that contextualization, whether they're giving or taking, I think is really, really powerful and makes people feel like they can be part of the change and those small actions do add up. Indeed, Tessa. And because, because of my experience, I'm aware of the kind of the infrastructure in the UK. But, you know, there's a very powerful voluntary sector community network in the UK that could, you know, if you were to work with them, you could access the harder to reach communities or those in, in poverty. Are you doing that at all? So, so we, we see, you know, in the UK, if we take the issue of, of hunger, for example, there, there's somewhere between eight and 10 million people in the UK who are living in food poverty, which is absolutely mind boggling and criminal that in this day and age that exists. Um, but only sort of one to two million of those people are getting access to uh, charitable services. So there's actually the majority of people are what we refer to as the hidden hungry. So these are people who do have a roof over their head and they do have access to mobile technology, but they are making exactly that trade off you discussed, which is between heating and eating. And what they love about Olio is precisely the fact that it's not about charity. It's all about community. There is zero stigma associated with it. It's free and available to anybody to use. And there's no quotas, there's no forms. You don't have to go see your GP, for example, to get access to that service. Uh, and that really is, is the beauty of it, the community, not charity. Thank you very much for responding to that challenging question. Um, to Marcus and Sanjali, uh, Sanjali um, offsetting, uh, you know, both of you in different ways are involved in creating apps that, you know, create that sort of offsetting opportunity, but does that drive, drive bad behavior? Marcus, to you. Happy to, happy to go first. Um, the, the clear answer to that is no. That's a hoax that is very much in need to be debunked because that is a, a hoax that actually is damaging because it prevents people from taking action that is effective. 
It was, however, a question when we started that we asked ourselves as well, because that would be the last thing that we would do. Um, but it's, there's very clear data uh, that shows that actually the opposite is true. There's data from German universities, University of Hamburg and Kassel that have looked into this already years ago and clearly um, debunked uh, this hypothesis. Um, and we are seeing it in our data as well, right? We have thousands of users right now that are using the Klima app to, to offset their emissions every month. And what we see clearly is that their overall footprint is going down over time, not up. Uh, and so um, there's also a common sense aspect to it um, that if you are financially invested in any topic, right, you want it to succeed. In Germany, you say uh, you don't want to tear down with your butt what you build up with your hands. Right. And that's kind of the same with offsetting. I feel people that are starting to offset start to think about their emissions in their everyday life and it supports a climate conscious behavior. Um, and that's clearly what we can see by data as well. Thank you. Sanjali? I would add to that that especially what we're finding is when offsetting is linked to behavior change it is especially effective at incentivizing reduction. Um, so in our, in our case, users connect their credit and debit cards, see the emissions behind every purchase, and then they can subscribe to offset them. Um, that means that your offset subscription is personalized to your own unique footprint. And I know Klima's is also personalized as well. Um, but in the Joro app, if you change your behavior from month to month, your offset fee also changes. So if you emit less, you pay, pay less. And if you emit more, you pay more. And it functionally operates like a carbon tax. Um, what that's similar to is when companies are using offsetting as a price on carbon, there is significant research that shows that it helps to reduce emissions instead of increase them over time. And that's a similar concept to what we're applying in the app too, is you're effectively using carbon offsets as a price on carbon. And we have seen over the year of 2021, we looked at users' carbon footprints before Joro and after Joro, people who offset and people who didn't. And we found that people who offset actually reduced their emissions by 6% more than people who didn't. And uh, we really believe that's because of that financial incentive to reduce. Um, but I think like Marcus said, our community are some of the first people in the world who are taking ownership of their emissions and offsetting. And they definitely have significant intention to lower global emissions and offsetting is just part of that strategy. Um, what I hope is that we can use our community um, and to be able to show that offsetting can be used effectively to draw down emissions you can't reduce, and even as an incentive for additional reduction. Okay, good. but I've got you. Um, I'm asking this to all of you actually, <laughs> is about your business model. So how do you survive? Is it through uh, consumers that pay into the app? Uh, is that your business model? Sanjali? In the case of Joro, uh, the app is free and always will be. This speaks to the accessibility point uh, that Tessa brought up too. Um, anyone can download the app and see the emissions behind their purchases for free and tracking will always be free. If you choose to offset, then you do have to pay money to draw down those emissions around the world. Um, and that's currently our major source of revenue. Looking forward, we hope to be able to point people towards relevant product services and behaviors to them and help monetize reduction as well. Great. I mean, just, well, I'll come back to this point, but it just seems to me that governments could play a role in supporting and underpinning some of this activity. Marcus, how do you, how do you make money? Um, similar you personally to, through the app. Yeah, so we also have a, an offset subscription that's currently the source of, um, of revenue to the app. Uh, we use all of the funds from users to um, promote uh, climate impact in one way or the other. Large part of that goes directly towards users offsetting their personal carbon footprint. Part of that goes towards reaching new users through marketing. And we um, last year spent 20% on that. We have an annual impact report that also shows how much impact gets reported by that. So for example, last year, we were able to create six times the climate impact through community building than we did with direct offsetting. So we really make sure we link every part of what we spend uh, exactly to something that can be measured again in impact. And we're right now uh, building out additional revenue streams that will then create a potentially also profitable business uh, as we are offering um, business services. Uh, so allowing companies to integrate Klima into their team culture and use that as, a, as an engagement tool to uh, make ESG part of the lift day-to-day -day culture in their teams. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Tessa. So we generate revenues through our B2B proposition, which I haven't touched on yet. So yeah. that is called our Food Waste Heroes program. 
we have 45,000 trained volunteers who are members of the OLEO community who we match with their local business uh, outlet. So that could be a supermarket or a bakery or a corporate canteen. And on your allotted time, you can sort of basically get trained on our food safety management system and then claim a collection slot. And a collection slot is an opportunity to go to that store at the end of the day, pick up all of their unsold food, take it home, add it to the OLEO app, within minutes your neighbours are requesting it and minutes later they're popping around and picking it up and that takes that food waste from being considered a, a waste stream in the store to instead being fully redistributed into multiple homes in the local community within sort of one maximum two hours so at the moment those businesses are paying a waste contractor to take that food away now they're paying us to take it away and ensure it's eaten. That's lovely it's interesting that each of you are using the kind of the worst I suppose addressing the worst uh, aspects of human nature and flipping them round into the positive and actually showing people that um, you don't have to feel guilty, but actually you can do something and make change happen. My final question to each of you, and I think it's, I can't ignore it, the fact that we're living in, in a time of war. Um, we are seeing a situation where um, it's only going to ratchet up in terms of the issue about access to uh, energy. We've seen the discussions over the weekend about what the EU may or may not do in terms of dependency of gas uh, and oil from Russia. You know that in each of your backyards, the, the question of energy and fuel is uppermost in people's minds. How are you addressing that through your uh, applications, if at all? So, Tessa. Yeah, so we are uh, in the process of working up a, a, what we're referring to as kind of a cost of living um, campaign and the objective really is to galvanize the business community to work with us to set really aggressive targets for themselves to redistribute so much more surplus food from their stores than they are currently because the reality is we have more than enough food for people right we've just got to get it to the people who need or want it um, and similarly we're also trying to galvanize everyday people in their homes you know millions and millions of people who actually thankfully are not making that decision between heating and, and eating, but who do have plenty of surplus in their own homes, which they could be giving away instead of throwing away. Okay, excellent. Uh, Marcus? Yeah, through um, education, we really kind of take a lot of effort um, trying to explain the general principles uh, that can support a mindset shift and how we think about energy. I think kind of a lot of people are waking up from a time where it just seemed like it's this abundant source and it just comes out of the wall, et cetera, if I turn up the heating. Um, and so educating people around uh, why, uh, why this is a mission heavy based on the technology that you're using or how you use uh, um, energy at home or, or via transport and what the alternatives are. And really, I think you said it uh, very well before, it's not about shaming, it's about inviting people to the change that we all want to go through and need to go through, right? Changing out the ways that we kind of uh, consume energy. It shouldn't feel like we need to invite people uh, uh, to a mindset that doesn't feel like somebody is taking something away from me, mm -hmm. but more like somebody is enabling me to a lifestyle that I can aspire to, you know, green cities, less pollution, um, okay. you know, mm -hmm. switching to bike to a bike rather than a car. There's a lot uh, that is very positive uh, about that. And so we really constantly um, address this from a from a mind mindset shift uh, point of view. Okay. Thank you, Sanjali. Yeah, we really try to help people see the link between their personal choices and our systems and how our personal choices can help to influence our systems when we act together. So in the case of, of the war that we're in right now, we've been publishing a bunch of content about showing people in the US especially, how can we help with this movement towards electrification and a green energy revolution that will make us less dependent on oil in the long run and create more safety and security for all of us going forward. Um, so we actually published um, a blog and some content in the app and we actually have a home energy challenge too about more energy efficiency at home um, but also about how anyone can help switch their homes to green energy a lot of americans don't realize that even if you're not a homeowner or it doesn't make economic sense to install solar there are programs through your utility providers or through third parties that allow you to actually switch to 100% renewable energy. And um, over 50% of Americans can do that through their utility itself. Um, and 100% of Americans can do that through third party services. So we're really trying to help people see, 
there's personal choices. And when we make those personal choices together, we shift our systems. And, and with every action we suggest, trying to create that through line. Great, thank you. Um, so I need to kind of, I'm running out of time. I want to kind of uh, conclude on the transatlantic element of this. Um, it occurs to me that, you know, the three of you, if you multiply you by, you know, let's say 100,000, my goodness, what the impact that would have across the world in terms of, and I'm sure there are uh, hundreds and thousands of you across the world, but are just not connected because your solutions are savvy, they're intuitive, and they're clearly having an impact. What would you say, what would you like to see happen in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, mind about greater connectivity about, 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 I suppose, amongst people like yourself? Tessa? Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. There is an enormous um, opportunity there. Certainly kind of when you're, certainly in that kind of zero to one phase of being an entrepreneur, you're so kind of heads down and focused on your own specific market. But now... At Ferolia, we're now starting to embark upon international expansion in earnest, and that is resulting in a real mindset shift. We're now very, very proactively reaching out to our colleagues in other markets, and um, we're speaking to the team at Joro um, very soon. Uh, so I definitely yeah. think there's a, a lot of opportunity for us to learn from one another and basically go faster together and go further together. Excellent. Thank you. Marcus? Yeah, I, I can only agree with that. I think that uh, integration is now starting to happen. I think we are kind of in this new wave of kind of green tech companies that are two, three, maybe four years old at max um, and uh, that have started building the foundations of their business. And now we see a lot of um, of integration. We are uh, focused right now this year uh, to turn Klima into a platform that uh, allows our users to connect to amazing green services that help them decarbonize their lives and help them on their journey. Uh, and I think we will hopefully see much more collaboration in that regard going forward. Great. Thank you very much. Sanjali. I agree completely with both of those yeah. comments. And I would just add that I think also from a data perspective, um, having more um, consistency and standardization and um, collaboration across geographies is incredibly valuable because the nature of carbon accounting is that data sets are still quite nascent um, and we need more data on the product level, on the company level, um, a, you know, for, for every product and service we use to be able to make better and smarter choices about how we use our resources. Um, so we'd love to see and, and connect with folks across the world to make sure that we're pushing forward uh, the best standards and data. Excellent, thank you. Let's hope that though, you know, because I think it's really refreshing to see and hear you know, to, you know, three very different perspectives, but actually trying to do the same thing, but using tech creativity, but also that sense of understanding human nature. And I just hope that those perhaps policymakers who watch this or, you know, catalytic funders watching this might knock on your door. But I hope in our small way, we've been able to create that window uh, into looking at what you've done, uh, but also expose it to a wider community. Uh, I just hope it doesn't lead to Amazon or Facebook knocking on your door, which I hope that you will avoid. But that's my, my moral judgment about that, because actually there's something about the beauty of you not being becoming a giant, because uh, actually there's something about the beauty of your smallness, but also your capacity across the world to make those small steps into a big piece of change. Thank you all very much. It's been a delight talking to you and discuss, discussing this very important topic. We'll be continuing this conversation on transatlantic cooperation and making sure we look at tech solutions, but other types of solutions also on climate action. Thank you three for joining us and thank you our audience for listening and watching. Hope you found this stimulating and thought provoking and some of the ideas you might want to, you know, uh, uh, take, take advantage of, but also don't feel, feel free to reach out to our, you know, entrepreneurs if you want to actually build uh, or have a conversation further. Thank you all. Be careful, mind your distance and be safe and keep an eye on our website for our next offering from Friends of Europe. Thank you all very much. Take care. Bye-bye.